It's the week ending the 16th of January, and this is The Week Unwrapped. In the past seven days, we've heard President-elect Trump's first press conference, news of a fresh crisis in the NHS, and an all-new Jeremy Corbyn. But we're here to bring you some stories that passed under the radar this week. The big news not making headlines right now, but with repercussions for all of our lives. I'm Ollie Mann. Let's unwrap the week. And with me today from the week's digital team are Rebecca Gilley, Arian McNichol and Elizabeth Carr-Ellis. And to start the show with his top pick of the week, it's Arian. What have you got for us? So this is about a small product that has had a big impact on the world. There had already been products before which allowed you to check emails on the move. But the iPhone was the first which integrated emails, web surfing, music and all the other original apps. And according to the technology writer Rupert Goodwins, this changed us profoundly. With a smartphone, you're taking the entire environment of your life around with you. You've always got all your music, you've always got all your work there, and that's created this, this, this bubble around us that we take everywhere and is shielding us from the outside world. Rupert Goodwin, and before that, Paul Moss, reporting for the BBC World Service. Uh, Arian, the iPhone. It's uh, been around for a while now. It's geriatric, basically, in tech terms. So yes. why are we talking about it today? Well, so it turned 10 on Monday. Ah, By the end of 2006, Apple was a company worth £55 billion. Today, it's a company worth half a trillion pounds. So it's had a pretty big impact on Apple as a company. But as we heard from Rupert Goodwins there, it's a product that also comes with certain downsides. And I think that what he's talking about is the way that it's affected our work-life balance. Yeah, and that's the shift, isn't it, in the last 10 years? I remember when the iPhone was launched. I remember Steve Jobs there on the stage. It's a phone. It's a computer. It's an iPod. It's the iPhone. And all the Apple geeks wet themselves, but everyone else was like, yeah, I don't need that. But (laughs) now the smartphone is the phone. If you try and buy a budget phone, it's essentially a bad smartphone, isn't it? It's interesting that this year, at the beginning of the year, France passed this right to disconnect law, which effectively makes it incumbent upon workplaces to allow their their employees to not have to work sometimes. Okay, let's go around the room here. Uh, Elizabeth, when you get home in the evening, do you disconnect or do you check your emails in bed like everyone else? I've become very, very strict because I realised I was getting so addicted My hand is aching because I don't have my iPhone with me. But it's hard to discipline yourself, isn't it? It's actually hard to say, right, you almost have to have a rule in your head. Mm. I get in the door, I put it down, I don't look at it. There are companies that are experimenting with stopping delivering emails later in the day. So after their employees leave work, they can't actually be contacted by the office. But that kind of self-discipline, I have none either. I'm absolutely unable to even turn the phone off at night when I go to bed. Yeah, the notifications thing is interesting, isn't it, Rebecca? I don't know if you have those turned on, but obviously the companies that provide them, Sky News, for example, they like to send one a day, even if there's no news. As a millennial, I haven't yet fallen out of love with constant connectivity. Um, But then I should say, as an aside, I never, ever respond to work emails that I get outside of work hours anyway. What about the fact that it's killing off conversation itself? You know, phones pre-smartphone and pre-iPhone mm. used to be used for actually phoning people. Oh, yeah, I never I never phone anyone. My mum is constantly telling me that I need to ring companies yeah. to, to get anything So done. I wonder I if it's d- also changing the way the 100%, communication works. You know, there's a kind of an ongoing joke about voicemail, how parents leave you voicemails, but you will never, ever listen to them. Yes. It's definitely a change in communication. I'm not convinced that it's necessarily a change for the worse. As someone who often says things that they regret, I think it can be a very useful <laughs> barrier. Revisiting a couple of innovations that came about with the iPhone. I wonder if I could just sort of run through a couple and see if you guys think that these were positive net or negative net uh, (laughs) changes to our life. What about GPS? You now have people driving off cliffs and into rivers. No, I'm going to take issue with you. (laughs) I'm dyspraxic, so actually my whole life before was just swearing at myself and sort of borderline self-harming every time I was driving anywhere because I couldn't find anywhere. And now I use it to get everywhere. I used it to get here today. I use it when I'm walking down the street. And not having to carry an A to Z. Yes, I used to carry an A to Z. I did used to do that. That's true. Okay, what Okay, what about selfies? Front-facing camera was introduced in the iPhone 4. Elizabeth evil of the world. Rebecca. 
I love selfies. Not of myself because my chin never seems to sit right <laughs> in them. However, selfies, me and my fiance take them all the time. Our friends take them all the time. I mean, people used to take photos of themselves in the mirror. I mean, for some reason, people still do do that. What about batteries that only last one day? <laughs> I think we can all agree that isn't it. Yeah. And what about Apple as a company? Because they sold over 45 million iPhones in the last three months of 2016, which is 5% down on the same quarter last year. Um, I know that there are emerging markets all over the world that are getting their first smartphones. But still, do you think the bubble is going to burst? Definitely. And I think that we're pretty much at smartphone saturation point. It's what all of the figures show. So really, for Apple's sake, they're going to have to think of a way to innovate a new product, which is why there's, you know, murmurs of the Apple car and we saw the the Apple Watch a few years ago. So yeah, they're they're definitely going to have to move away from the iPhone as the driver of their profits. But it is going to be where you have to have one just because you have to have one. So while it might have reached saturation, it is here to stay. Yes, and of course there's the updates that end up paralysing your old phone anyway. (laughs) You know, even if you want to keep the one that you had from five years ago. You're going to have to buy a new one. You're going to have to buy a new one. Uh, Built-in obsolescence, uh, as we've discovered with this conversation. So let's move on to the next topic. Uh, Rebecca, what have you brought to the table? Uh, Well, this just goes to show that when it comes to Twitter, there is no such thing as a free lol. We've all known that psychology will tell you the power of word of mouth and how people, they move in masses. Then they also conform to consensus, the opinion of the majority. So what we essentially do is harness that word of mouth and get people to move with the the majority. And we've got guys in here that know how to, I guess, hack these channels to make businesses or brands grow. It's been widely written about that social chain has the capabilities of making anything the number one trending topic on Twitter in less than half an hour. So these guys are the the best at it, in my opinion. That was Steve Bartlett, the CEO of Social Chain, speaking to BBC Radio 4. You can hear the full programme on their documentary podcast called Seriously. So, Rebecca, let's be clear here. This is a young company that is able to manipulate social media for their clients. Is that it? Yeah, that's right. Um, It's a very young company as well. Their average age is 22 Uh, They were founded by two university dropouts, and they own around 400 popular Twitter accounts. And by by own? So does someone set it up, it becomes popular, and they buy it? Yeah, the example they use in that particular documentary is um, there's a popular Twitter account called Student Problems, which posts those kind of, uh, you know, my face when X happens and I still have X essays to write, etc. You make it sound so formulaic. I know. But that's now owned by by social chain so for every tweet like that you'll have some of their clients apple uh lots of major companies advertise with them so for every few joke tweets you'll now have an advertising tweet and obviously this has been going for some time now but for me it plays into a bit of a wider theme about what's true and what's not online Mm. and have we developed the tools to understand what's true and what's not online the way we do in real life for instance i think most of us if you take tv ads for example we know what they look like and we know when they're going to happen. If you're watching Coronation Street and the characters suddenly started having a conversation about, you know, Adidas trainers, we'd think there's something not right here. But it's very easy to let that just wash over you online. I don't know if you've heard of SponCon, sponsored content, uh, celebrities being paid to use their Instagrams to post opinions, which are actually ads. Naomi Campbell was caught out a few months ago doing this when she accidentally posted the email she'd received from the company instead of the (laughs) caption. So it said something like, Hi, Naomi, maybe something like this. Loving these new blah, blah, blah. Don't you think that people are pretty wise to this stuff these days? It's not as if advertising has just started to try to fool us since the emergence of the internet. No, but I think what we're looking at is our framework. We're struggling to fit our real-life framework onto the online world. So, you know, obviously, initially they thought, well, just hashtagging it with ads, that's a good internet savvy solution but now we're saying it's not really effective but the lines are kind of blurred aren't they and they always have been in the sense that you know if Versace send Philip Schofield a new suit and he wears it to present a quiz show you know is that sponsored is that advertising I mean yeah, you know, exactly. that's gone on for ages anyway yeah and it, I mean it, but it goes even further because you know there's been a lot of talk recently about fake news I mean conspiracy theories seem to be an increasingly vocal 
presence on the internet but the majority of people you know probably even people we know family and friends that share ridiculous stories on facebook or retweet total conspiracies on twitter if someone gave them a pamphlet like with that information on the town center they'd look at it and throw it away mm. anyone can tweet then their tweet does not look any different to a tweet from the bbc or reuters whereas you know if some crackpot hands you a newspaper they've handwritten you're not gonna look at that and look at the times and think well there's two sides to every story. But publications, media, they have set rules. There are code of conducts that they have to follow or they get into trouble. There is nothing like that on Twitter. There is no accountability whatsoever. And what should those rules be? How would you do it, Lizzie? How would you make it clear? <laughs> That's the trouble at the moment, as you said. They have to write on that it's an ad or an SP. If you Google what is SP, you get thousands of hits of people going, what on earth is SP mm. on Twitter? I see it all the time. People don't understand these rules. When you're watching Coronation Street, you know when the advert comes up. You don't know it in Twitter. And it is just fed in amongst all the rest of your Twitter feed. So it needs to be highlighted much better, much clearer. So is this a demographic thing? Like, actually, does it need to be highlighted for people who are not even millennials, but the generation under that? Yeah, there was a really interesting point later on in the documentary where Uh, he spoke to some sixth form pupils and one of them described themselves as a corrupted generation. There was a girl who said that she's very easily influenced by what she sees on social media and then she said something along the lines of I'm not sure why I want what I want anymore. You know, so she was really open to the idea that if you're being advertised something and you want it, is that okay because you want it or do you only want it because it's being directly marketed to you? But also possibly that younger demographic who are being influenced by their trendy older brother or sister on YouTube possibly don't care. It's not just a case that they're sort of savvy enough to understand that the person's getting paid, but actually they kind of think that's cool. I mean, that is a shift, isn't it? Lizzie, you sort of grew up, I guess, in the punk era where the idea of someone doing something alternative was that it was anti-establishment and, you know, bollocks to the rules. These young people, the people who are watching them and and relating to them are like, oh, cool, Nike gave them loads of money. That's great. They like them too. They just don't see that conflict. Because these people have huge amount of influence. I mean, you're talking millions of people following them. Everybody's just looking the same. We're losing all that anti-establishment act. And they mightn't care. But I think when they're older and they look back on their life, they're going to say, I was such a mug for being taken in like that. Are they or are they going to say, oh, yeah, Red Bull put lots of money into action sports. That was good. I don't know. I mean, they genuinely don't seem to mind. Um, There is evidence, actually, that young people do care about what they're doing online. There was a recent report by the Children's Commissioner for England that found that a lot of children from the age of five upwards were signing complicated terms and agreements online to use social media platforms like Instagram and Facebook. But obviously they had no way of understanding. So they brought a solicitor in with a group of children and the solicitor rewrote the contract in terms they could understand. And according to the report, a lot of them were shocked by how many rights they had signed over. Um, and a lot of them said they were going to quit Instagram, Snapchat, etc. once they realised that the companies had basically bought the rights to sell that information and their private data around the world. And who of us really does read the T's and C's <laughs> of, yeah, we are uh, of exactly. things that we we're signing up to? I, I read a, a Guardian survey that found that just 7% of people read the full terms of... Um, I'm surprised that's uh, that high. Yeah, yeah, totally. Yeah, and, and it's 7% of people who fill in a survey at The Guardian. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah. it's a crucial thing. Yeah. And that's a good point. I mean, as, as grown-ups, we kind of make the decision not to care about the T's and C's because it's convenient. But children make that decision without really understanding that they're then trapped in it forever. You know, they, they haven't thought and understood, OK, I'm signing away some of my data. I just can't be bothered to read the details. They just haven't thought about that bit at all. You know, you're posting things at a kind of sensitive time in your life that you might not look on with pride in later years. You know, every embarrassing Facebook status you've ever written as a sulky 16-year-old is going to be there forever and ever, and they have signed away their right to it. So I'd say it's even worse when an adult signs away their rights to something knowingly <laughs> rather than a child doing it unknowingly. But it's convenient. I found this office easily. <laughs> uh, Elizabeth, you're going to close the show today. What have you brought for us? This week we said goodbye to a very special lady. I want our young people to know that they matter, that they belong. So don't be afraid. You hear me, young people? Don't be afraid. Be focused. (laughs) Be determined. Be hopeful. Be empowered. Empower yourselves with a good education. Then get out there and use that education to build a country worthy of your boundless promise. Lead by example with hope. Never fear. And know that I will be with you. (laughs) rooting for you and working to support you for the rest of my life. 
The outgoing First Lady there, Michelle Obama, delivering her last public address this week. Uh, So, uh, Lizzie, we're going to have Melania Trump taking on the role next week. Is that why you've chosen this moment in time? (sighs) Don't. I'm going to start crying. I love Michelle Obama. If Michelle Obama was in this room, I would kiss her so much. Because (laughs) she has just been a really, really inspiring First Lady. Why? Um, What's she done? She has shown that a First Lady doesn't have to be someone who stands mutually by her man. And sadly, it always is a man. And she has shown that women have just as much voice as men when it comes to what's going on in the world. And that young women should learn this and know this. She's also unelected, though, isn't she? And, you know, although you were just saying that you'd cry about Melania Trump becoming First Lady and replacing her by comparison, if there wasn't this precedent that First Ladies get involved and do the politics, that wouldn't be such a worrying concern for you. I think Michelle Obama has played very canny because she hasn't actually been political. She's taken on stances which have been very much in keeping with her role as mom-in-chief, as she likes to call herself. And she says that has been a constant throughout her time at the White House. And it has. What she's done is look very much at how she can improve life for children without doing anything overtly political. Kind of uncontroversial topic, isn't it? Except maybe the healthy eating stuff, which, you know, Americans do not like to be told not to drink milkshakes, do they? Well, they have had a lot of success with that, actually. She's been she's been very good. And I think people are aware that there's a problem. There's a huge obesity problem in the States and that what she's trying to do is help. She's not trying to change them. She's not trying to say, don't have your milkshake. She's just saying there's an alternative. One of the things she did, which I thought was very, very clever, was she went against sugar and fizzy drinks. She went against fizzy drinks. But she didn't say, don't drink fizzy drinks. Do you not know how stupid you are drinking them? (laughs) She said, wouldn't it be better to drink water instead? Water's great. We love water. So she's been very clever in how she focuses the debate. I think the other cleverness of that particular campaign is that it's a way in to address issues that matter in a slightly more fundamental way because, you know, obesity disproportionately affects low-income people and minorities and the same holds for the gaps in education jobs and wealth so it's it's her way in to try to find a way to have some positive impact on things that are much more underlying okay all right so so we're all in the michelle obama fan club you know i like her too she's great she's very classy isn't she rebecca have you got anything bad to say about obama nothing bad to say about michelle obama however I do, in a way, welcome Melania Trump Great. entering the White why. House. Why? Let me tell you why. Stir it up. Uh, <laughs> are you listening, Lizzie? This is why you should be excited. My ears are but don't worry, already. it's for a it's a, for a backhanded, bleeding liberal reason. Um, <laughs> <laughs> the whole institution, the First Lady, is troublesome. The whole, number one tricky, as Donald would say. Yes. The idea was that a, you know, a man as busy as the president needed a, a wife who would organise his social functions in Washington and redecorate the White House, which seems to be in a continual state of disrepair. So, I mean, that was what first, first ladies did. You know, we all remember JFK and Lyndon B. Johnson's administrations being very progressive, but Jackie Kennedy and Lady Bird Johnson's big achievements were literally renovating the White House. Mm. And they didn't seek to do anything. You know, they, it's not like they tried to do something else and were you know, repressed. They just understood that that was their role and they were happy to fulfil it. So... You know, from the time of Rosalind Carter in the 70s up through your Nancy Reagans and your Barbara Bushes and your Hillary Clintons, you know, you've seen First Ladies take on that more political public role. But really, it's just masking what the role actually is, which is presidential arm candy and social scheduler. So I think if Melania Trump fulfills that traditional role, then, you know, people will wake up to the idea that it's all it is all a bit skeevy. That's the traditional role, how it's seen. But the truth is, they have always been members of the family who've been helping the politicians. If you go back to Theodore Roosevelt, his sister, Bai, was apparently much more politically astute, much more politically aware, and she had a huge influence on him. Fundamentally, it's just the the reason they're in that position is because they're married to the president. They're not actually in an elected office. And I agree that people who are related to high-profile politicians have always had that extra springboard that extra visibility to do something with it. But fundamentally, it's a title that's, you know, it's created to say, well done for being a wife. You sort of can't retreat from it in America, though, like you can in the UK. You know, Samantha Cameron was quite 
not I wouldn't say political, but campaigning, you know, and and did events for charity and all the rest of it. Really, Cherie Blair, not so much, and uh, Philip May, not at all. So it's kind of up to them, isn't it? Whereas in the US, if you're first lady. You are going to be on the front of the magazines. You're going to be talked about. And to be fair to Melania, she's already spelled out a a political direction that she wants to take, which is to end online bullying hilariously because, you know, given who her husband is and what he does, it's, uh, I mean, it's a remarkable thing for her to No stranger to to the subject. But I, well, and I guess she's close to the source, so she can, (laughs) she can uh, uh, really impact that firsthand. But, um, but no, I mean, she, she's not necessarily going to stand idly by and, uh, and I don't know that we can yet predict what Melania is going to do. And from all reports, she's a woman who shouldn't be underestimated. She speaks five languages. She, you know, made her way to what is now one of the highest offices, unelected offices in the land. So By standing in a bikini with a nine millimeter gun in her hand, posing for a camera. But at that point, you know, if her ambitions were to do with her husband rather than her own career, if they were to do with her husband, it was about marrying someone rich and becoming a New York socialite, not about becoming first lady. We've got to give her a break there, haven't we? His political ambitions only came into focus four years ago. But isn't that a modern marriage where you have a partnership and you both talk about what you want for your relationship? So he might have decided he wanted to do this, but surely in a modern relationship, that should be a joint decision, especially when we're talking about President of the United States. We're not talking about somebody taking a part time job down the corner shop. I have a feeling no one says no to Donald Trump about anything if they want to remain his friend. I think Ivanka does. Well, that will be an interesting relationship as well, won't it? She's moving to Washington too. Yeah, I think that she could end up taking on some of those uh, more traditional first lady roles, which has happened before. There's been, I think, nieces and daughters who've taken on the first lady role historically. So I wouldn't be surprised if, I mean, it looks more like she's going to take to the political side. But her stepping down from the Trump organization and her own companies yeah. and moving to Washington does seem to foreshadowing of uh, of some sort of political role. And I'm going to ask a horribly sexist question, but don't shoot the messenger. It's just because if you Google Melania Trump, this is what you get. Speculation about what she wears. I know that shouldn't be the case, but it is. With the First Lady, people say, well, Michelle Obama wore a lot of J. Crew and Banana Republic, you know, high street stores, top end high street stores, but affordable stores in the U.S., She, Melania, wears top-end designers, you know, $1,500 dresses and all the rest of it. Does that matter? I mean, she's wearing what is sort of true to her as a New York socialite, but people will say, oh, well, she's she's alienating, particularly women. So long as it's nice, I really don't care how much it costs. It's like, you know, the Duchess of Cambridge walking out in a top shop dress. Wear the designer. You can afford the designer. Trust me, if somebody in Newcastle had all the money she had, they're not <laughs> going to be wearing a top shop dress. They're going to be straight to Dolce & Gabbana. We ran an article on the, on the Week website about Melania Trump. And one of the things that she said previously, this was way before um, her husband launched his campaign, was that she would envision, her, because he had previously sought a nomination, I think in 2000, Mm -hmm. she said that she wanted to be an a Jackie Kennedy style first lady, which to me reads as aspirational. Jackie Kennedy was not going out there to high street stores, you know, buying her clothes there. She was a socialite and she ran the White House like a socialite. There's certainly an argument to be made that there's nothing fundamentally wrong with doing that. No, and it's not just about how she looks, but um, but I read a recent article about the way that um, Melania has been using her fashion choices to make political statements, including on the day of the election wearing a white pantsuit which is traditionally something that Hillary Clinton uh, was associated she, with that was a big mistake though that did not look good she also <laughs> wore a pussy bow yes. after the yeah. leaked audio tapes immediately after the leaked audio tapes about <laughs> Donald Trump and the, so uh, there was speculation about quite who she was trolling with that on that bum note that is it for <laughs> this edition of the week unwrapped my thanks to Rebecca Gilly Elizabeth Carr Ellis and Arian McNichol for more from the week you need to visit theweek.co.uk, download The Weekday, which is our free iPhone app, or you can subscribe, of course, to the magazine. And don't forget to subscribe to this podcast to hear brand new episodes of The Week Unwrapped as soon as they're available via iTunes or Pocket Casts, Stitcher, basically wherever you get your podcasts. I've been Ollie Mann. Our music is by Tom Morby. The producer is Matt Hill at Rethink Audio. And until we unwrap next week, goodbye. Goodbye.